Want to go far in business and in life? You can't do it alone. The secret is expanding your network of personal relationships, building friendships, connecting on an intimate level, away from the office, over a coffee or cocktail. Welcome to All In with the real Nate Payo. The show that asks what happens when you go all in and leverage the power of your network of personal relationships. From author Donnie Bovine comes the book, How to Be a Success Champion, available on Amazon. After years of living other people's dreams, author Donnie Bovine decided to jump out on his own and start a business, thinking it would be easy. Instead, he had a rude awakening and quickly understood that he had spent 20 years being an employee and had no idea how to be a business owner. His business was tanking, and he was on the brink of losing everything when he decided to fight for business freedom. In this must-read and life-changing book, author Donnie Donnie Bovine shares with readers his story intermingled with lessons learned from his mistakes and his failures. And how to be a success champion, you will find advice the author received from mentors and how he went from zero to a six-figure business. The author walks you through the steps of how to get out of your own way, how to play the game of business and win, find your strengths, how to network effectively, how to build a personal brand, how to create champions for your business, how to get great at sales, how to take complete ownership of you and your business how to be a success champion from author donnie bovine available on amazon in both kindle and paperback editions order your copy right now it makes a great book for corporate events too how to be a success champion from author donnie bovine available on amazon hello welcome to the all in podcast with nate payo of course i am your host nate payo today i'm joined by Goose McGrath. Goose is on a mission to help entrepreneurs and everyday Australians achieve financial independence and to build generational wealth through the vehicle of real estate investment. Welcome to the show, Goose. How are you? Nate, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to connect, particularly in this medium, and to, um, to be able to share any of my views and insights with your audience. So thanks for having yeah. me. It's good, good. So you know Goose is an, an iconic nickname from in the United States of, of one of the most popular movies of all time, Top Gun. I, you probably heard that a million times, huh? I have de- oh, mate, I've definitely, I've definitely copped that. So th- here's a, here's a, there's a couple of different lenses to put that. So my real uh, name on my birth certificate is Glenn McGrath. Now that probably won't mean anything to you, but he is one of the greatest cricketers of all time. And <laughs> uh and he was quite famous during my whole tenure of growing up. He sort of and so in Australia, which is a pretty fairly cr- cricket mad nation, Glenn McGrath gets just as much uh, chagrin, shall we say, as uh, as you know, goose from Top Gun. <laughs> then there's there's a small fraction of people out there who who recognise the goose uh, reference from Mad Max. So you sort of get these different uh, different vectors and insights into who people are based on how they re- how they react and respond uh, to to the. I mean, I go by goose professionally as well, but it's really interesting as well because it's the easiest way to put a smile on someone's face. I love it. You know, what's funny is like any, anybody I've ever met from Australia in the United States has always been just like super vibrant, totally full of energy. And like, I don't know, maybe it's because they have that, this accent that's just like charming and stuff too, that people are just like captivated towards them, but it's probably not quite the same in Australia when everybody talks the same. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think maybe you've just had a good run. I'd say it's probably even split. I mean, I've spent, um, uh, obviously I spend quite a reasonable amount of my time and energy interacting with, um, with people from the U S. So I see the balance of communication styles and, and stuff like that. I definitely would say I'm on the more, um, uh, buoyant side of the energy, any energy spectrum. Not everyone's like me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's how I get to show up in the world and really build, really build connection. And, and I, yeah, I love it. I, I think that's cool. Like you, you, you said, it's how you choose to show up for the world. So my first question for you, 
is regarding luck and and how you perceive luck. Do people are people lucky? You know, are you lucky? What what's your thoughts and feelings around that word? Um, y- yes and no. Uh, I believe I don't believe in a, an esoteric. Um, some people are just lucky. I, I don't believe that kind of uh, that it just happens. But I do believe that there is uh, a, a an esoteric waiting that happens when you take the right actions in line with those things, and they're actions that you don't necessarily need to know that you're taking. So I guess just to, to expand on that, it, it's it's. I don't think you can set a plan to go, all right, so if I, if I work really hard and uh, work out in the mornings and follow a good routine, I'm going to, I'm going to become lucky. I don't think it's as, um, as regimented as that, but it's also not on the other end of the spectrum where people just are born lucky and, hey, and I, on a personal level, I genuinely, deeply believe that I am the luckiest person in the world that I know, like honestly, like genuinely. <laughs> and there's, there's elements of that that are associated with um, things that are not related to my work ethic or my personality or my attitude or perspective on life. Um, you know, I've been in major accidents. I've survived that kind of stuff. Um, I've, been, I've had all this like roller coaster of, um, of life like most people have. And I've come out of it in a way that, it, that I'm, I'm constantly in a state of uh, opportunistic joy. Mm-hmm. However, um, a lot of the, the other side of that though is um, through my life, a lot of people have said to me, oh man, you're so lucky because of the things that I've achieved or the things that I've done or the, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, that, none of that's luck. Like none of, that's just like, that's just me going out and getting what I want. And I think that there's a, somewhere in the middle, there is a, there is a universal force, um, but it, it is, it is, it's tied to something deeper as well. I, I agree with that. Like, you know, your actions, take you in the places that the circumstances might, you know, favors might bless you. You know, if you show up every day from work, the chances of you being successful at work are going to be higher than if you only show up part of the time, you know, Um, or you get that one client that really, you know, makes or breaks your career. Like, you know, very rarely the first day you showed up on the job, the, you met that person, everything goes up. It's, it's about constantly reinforcing the circumstances you, you're in. But you also kind of talked about, you know, like surviving, um, you know, potentially traumatic events and, and you roll out of it good. And I think that also, you know, sometimes people have a calling that, that they're supposed to give and serve the world in some sort of capacity. And like those near experiences are what makes you like realize like, Hey, there, there's something to be thankful for that. I could have ended up, you know, splattered on the pavement and I didn't. Um, so I should really be, you know, conscious of the actions I take and, and do, uh, the, the right, you know, make the right decisions, take the right course of action so that I'm putting myself into positions to be this version of myself that I'm called to be and serve the people I'm there to serve. So you're, you're probably right on both, both aspects, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I'd like to put something, uh, a layer into that as well. You said do the right things and take the right actions that are going to move you to the right place. And that, that to me implies that, um, that, there are, there are, that there are right things to do. And I would say, to polarize that, the greatest um, experiences that have shaped my existence and uh, have led to my greatest su- successes in a, an extremely tangential way are uh, decisions and activities, which would probably be wrong decisions. <laughs> however, however, when I've made those decisions, I have made them like full out, like, like I've be, I played full out and whether that be into addiction or whether that be into whatever, it was like, it was consciously knowing like I'm going to, I'm going to go as hard as I can in this direction. Mm-hmm. I know that it might not be the right direction, but I'm going to go as hard as I can because I don't want to play. I don't want to play with, I don't want to play. I don't want to play in halves. I want to play in full and no matter what I do. And I think that that attitude is the thing that will drive more success because if you, if you play full out, even in anything, you're going to at least find the extremities and that'll give you the perspective to experience it fully and to know how to apply that in the rest of your, rest of your life. I, I like that because it's all about 
you know, really pushing the limits and, and discovering, you know, what you're, what you're capable of. So we don't always know the right from the wrong answer. Like, you know, like, Hey, maybe stealing's right and wrong. Like that, that's more black and white. But if you say, do I go left or do I go right? Like, I don't know. They, they, either way, it could be right. But if I'm going to go right, I don't want to go, well, I should have gone left the whole time and just be constantly, you go, hey, we chose, we made a decision. Let's see where this path goes. Let's, let's not worry about what could have been or what should have been. But hey, I'm on this path now and let's see where it takes us. It tends, to, it tends to work out where you, you learn a lot about yourself for sure. 100%. 100%. Cool. So, so you're, you're looking to help people um, around financial independence, so specifically about real estate investment, like what are the types of work you're up to? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a, I think there's something that's worth uh, discussing is the the dissimilarities between Australian real estate and U.S. real estate. So, and and this is a really interesting thing because in the U.S. Um, there is much more when people talk about achieving financial independence through real estate investing, it's all about cash flow. Right? Mm-hmm. Stack houses on top of houses, basically, just but just keep buying houses. I like buy buy high, high yielding houses that produce a lot of cash flow and you just do buy a, you can reverse engineer it. You can literally just go, I want to have a hundred thousand dollars income, therefore I just need to buy X amount of houses that do X and the houses, and there's a different lending environment too. So the houses can actually be um, used in a different way from on a finance. Uh, level to be able to self-service their own debts, right? So there's a there's a couple of different caveats there. Australia has uh, ostensibly a a growth oriented market, which is interesting because I, I I've worked with a few uh, U.S. entrepreneurs who who uh, have moved to Australia or had an interest in investing in Australia, and uh, they were like, "Oh, great! So we can do what we do in the U.S., but we do it in Australia. We'll just stack all these properties on top of each other." I'm like, "No, it doesn't work like that," because what we have is a different, we've got a different economic environment, which produces different outcomes and results. Um, so what that means is we have much, much higher appreciation, you guys would call it. We have a mm-hmm. much, more, much more significant appreciation, which, um, which provides the compound benefit, which supersedes that of just stacking properties on top of each other to get more cash flow. That being said, the premise uh, by which uh, Americans typically seeking financial independence using real estate uh, approach it, which is, well, it doesn't really matter. Like uh, it's about achieving a cash flow goal because that's the thing that's going to fund my life. That is a piece that is missing from the vernacular and the psyche of the average Australian, Australian real estate investor. And that is a message that um, I'm passionate about sharing. Now, I believe that there is a, a, a place in the middle where you can get good appreciation, stronger appreciation than you would likely see in, in most parts of the US and also achieve higher levels of cash flow in a property than most people believe that you can reasonably expect and also get growth in Australia. And it's around this idea that we formed uh, our three core principles, which we call the Holy Trinity, which is about being able to find properties which are cash flow positive, so net cash flow positive, producing net income, and get high capital growth or high appreciation and have the ability to manufacture more equity and more value over time. Now, those principles are fantastic because they serve as a, as a guiding light to indicate and to dictate our, our, the entire activity around what we do as a business and how we approach the world and, and everything like that. Uh, and it's one of those things, it's really simple when you boil it down to three key principles, but it's just not super easy. But then what we've actually worked out is, A, how we can do that, where we can do that, and all of that stuff. And that's, I guess that's kind of our big thing that we're trying to bring out there is to democratize um, real estate investing from a, from a financial independence perspective, to educate people, to help uh, business owners and entrepreneurs who want to be able to divest out of their business but don't know how all of that kind of stuff and really encourage um, the entrepreneurial mindset to flourish within the real estate sector in Australia. Is, is real estate investing as a popular of a vehicle for investment as it is in the United States or is it like something that people tend to stay away from? It's so, so interesting, right? Uh, it is so interesting because I'm a big fan of bigger pockets, right? Do you know bigger pockets? 
No, go for it. Okay, so Bigger Pockets is um, a US based. It's a it's a behemoth of a, a brand um, that specifically deals with real estate investing and financial freedom and all of this stuff. Fantastic, I love it. Um, really great messages. But there's a really interesting um, difference between the US real estate investor and the Australian real estate investor. Australians are property mad. They absolutely love it. Probably as much as cricket and football, right? It is, it is, it's like dinner table conversation in a lot of places. Everyone talks about the real estate market. They're absolutely feverish about it. However, <laughs> however, it is also seen as only a game for the wealthy. And therein lies a uh, social cohesion aspect of the idea of real estate investing. Now, my background is not in real estate. My background is in festivals, um, touring the world, doing all that kind of stuff. I worked at Burning Man in the States, a whole bunch of other stuff. So my background is in um, a much more left um, ideological mindset. I mean, I used to be a punk, you know, anti-government, <laughs> all this stuff, right? And as I grew my uh, knowledge, aspirations, desires, and wanted to achieve more in my own life and turned to exploring real estate, uh, what, as I've moved into that direction, what I've noticed is that there's a whole world of people who no longer want to associate with who I am or, or what they believe that I stand for. And that is based around, that's based around the idea that real estate is only for rich people. It's only for the 1%. You know, you're robbing from everyone and blah, blah, blah. And, and, it's, and it's got a very negative overtone. And it really splits. It really creates a chasm in, um, I think, where, where we can kind of move as a society. So I think actually in, in the States, it's actually one of those things that people can start for not that much money and can really make something of themselves. You know, like you can save up a bit of cash, you can do a deal a lot easier and you can get started and you can start stacking cash flow. And so there's a little bit more of a, it's easier to, it seems, it seems I, haven't, I haven't invested in the States, right? But mm -hmm. it seems from what I can see to be easier to do. And therefore, it's not just the realms of, oh, you're finally, you're finally wealthy enough to be able to afford property because like our property prices are much higher here as well. So there's a few different, a few d d dissimilarities. Uh, so I would say it's popular, but it's also quite polarizing. Yeah, it's, I think there's some similarities to what you're discussing are describing in, in Australia is in the United States. Like in California, it's very, especially when you go coastal, it does become, you know, this appreciation thing, you know, especially like, I don't know if you're talking about investing in like, you know, multi-unit properties or just like a, a single residence, but like, let's say if you're investing in, in Malibu, you know, you're, you're probably buying a piece of uh, a house for, for $10 million and hoping you can sell it for 11 or 12, uh, versus what you could rent it out for to get a positive cash flow on, on, on a 10 or $12 million investment. But then that model kind of lends itself to you. You're, you're hoping you're always hoping that there's a bigger sucker than you, uh, to make the next transaction. You know, you, like you bought off somebody, they made a profit off of you. If you, if you didn't buy it in, in a distressed property that, you know, was in foreclosure or something. Uh, but then if you like look into uh, multifamily and apartment investing, or like, you know, you start getting more inland and into the center of the United States where prices of, of housing doesn't appreciate that much, then it does become cash flow. And then the cash flow you look at like, hey, if I if I buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars and it's gonna give me, you know, twelve thousand dollars a year in and net income, is it better to put it there or would it be better to put it in the stock market or some some dividends? So it's just kind of, you know, I always tell people like, hey, if you if you think um Real estate investing. Do, I don't know if they have the the sh these shows over for you, but there's like all these like house flipper shows out in the United States. Like people buy this property and they flip it, and then they they say, "Oh, you made you know thirty or fifty thousand dollars by buying this house and flipping it." And it's like it, in real estate investing, it's not glamorous and and sexy like it's portrayed. It's actually pretty boring. It's like you buy something at a low value and you resell it for a higher value. So if, if the markets are rising, like that's not the time you want to get in because you're probably going to get 
you know, a bad deal, but you want to be buying it with the markets going down. So you buy it when it's low and you sell when it's high, or you buy this investing game and you just, you know, take your, your cash flows and reinvest it. And then over time, like you have this big thing. So it's really, you're looking at, you know, a hundred deals to find one or two that even remotely make sense. Um, and then, and then you, then you make a, a smart choice and then you repeat that. And it's like, it's not always, you know, this fun, glamorous lifestyle. It's just kind of like kind of boring, like looking at pieces of paper and running numbers. Well, here's the secret. It should be boring. <laughs> if it's not boring, you're, you're actually doing it wrong. <laughs> you're doing it wrong. And now that doesn't mean that it has to be um, completely mundane. And I think the idea of just like, uh, I, I think the, some people want to be a bit more hands-on and that's mm-hmm. totally cool. Some people want to be active investors and that's great. But I can tell you that, um, in my experience and from my viewpoint, the people who are too active, i.e. the flippers and the traders and they buy quick and they sell quick and they're just constantly like they're buying and selling and buying and selling and they're just trying to like turn over properties. They ultimately don't get as far ahead. Much in the same way, much in the same way that when you look at the stock market, if you were to hedge, um, if you were to hedge an index fund against uh, against a, a, a trading hedge fund, you often find that the index funds will outperform because they basically just like push the chips that way and shut up and do nothing. And it was um, it was um, Jack Vogel, I think it was, who said uh, the 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 investing is the antithesis of business. In business, it's like um, don't just stand there and do something. But in investing, it's don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's kind of typifies a lot of people get excited about the opportunity in real estate. But this is something that I've had to learn in myself. Like I'm I'm probably the least patient person that I know. I'm like, I'm like, everything must happen faster now and I need more and let's do more and let's boom, 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 a million miles an hour. Um and it's a lesson that I have painfully had to learn through business and real estate is the key to the game is to just back off and slow down and just like take a much longer term view because you can have you can have anything you want you just can't have everything you want you can't have it all now you can have it all but it's going to come a little later and you just got to follow the process and take your time and let things compound and play a long game and all of that stuff It, it can be fun for sure but i think what i was also describing was the emotional roller coaster of it. If you're looking for the emotional roller coaster of it, you're probably going to make poor decisions. You're going to get uh, yeah. attached to a property that's not something you should. Or you're, you know, like, I've looked at ten. Like this, this, this one's, it's going to work. And you start making excuses for it to work. Uh, in reality, you do, you do want to be patient, and you want to, um, if it looks like it's going to work, like you better ask yourself a whole bunch of questions of what did you forget? What are you overlooking? Um, and, and, and try to like talk yourself out of it. And if you still get to yes, uh, that it's a good deal, then, then, you know, maybe it is, but it's, it's definitely, um, a different, a different experience. And, and especially if you're looking for cash flow too, you have to pay a lot of attention to your ongoing expenses, you know, property taxes and repainting and, you know, if the roof goes bad and, and those type of things could just eat away at any, any profits you might have if, if you're not fo- factoring that in, in the long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is actually kind of the foundation of uh, our Holy Trinity principles it, because we didn't pay attention to that kind of stuff at the start. And we just sort of paid attention to some of the metrics and went, oh, look, I think if we look, look, if we just pay attention to this, everything's going to be great. And then it wasn't like we bought right before a crash and blah, 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 and all that stuff. Um, but this is kind of the principles around why we look at, you know, cash flow growth and the ability to add value. Um, oh, I think we might've frozen there. Can you still hear me? Mm. Nate, are you there? Oh no. We've lost each other. Oh, 
Are you there? Mate, I'm here. We're back. Yeah, that's the third time my internet crashed today. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I tell you, since lockdown, the internet has been absolutely atrocious uh, here in Sydney. So I can empathize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll with it because that's, that's kind of how I did my shows. Like, hey, we have mistakes along the way and, and we learn as we go. So I don't oh, know man, what I'm, you left I'm, off on. It, mate, I'm, not too, I'm not too worried, but I can pick up where I left off. That's totally fine. And let's keep going. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Yeah. So what I was saying is that that's kind of the basis of how we formed our principles about real estate investing is because you mentioned something just earlier about uh, you've got to hope you're like you buy it and then you hope that someone wants to buy it for more. And that's exactly what I call a buy and hope strategy. And that is when you're like, I don't really know. I guess if I just buy this, it should go up in value, I think maybe. And I like to think, what if everything goes wrong? Like what if what if like you can you can try and buy the best property at the best price and you know what the cash flow is going to be and yeah, 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 yeah. And then you work it all out and you're like, yes, this feels like the best deal. And I've gone through 10, I've gone through 50, I've gone through 100, whatever it is, I found the right one. I found the right one. And then you need to ask yourself, well, that's great, but what if everything goes wrong? What if all the stuff outside of my control goes wrong? What if we have socio-political upheaval? What happens if industries shut down and no one can rent the property, what if, like you've really got to go to a worst case scenario and this is actually lends itself into a way that I like to approach decision making in general, like any big decision in my life. You really got to weigh up what's the upside and what is the downside and can I live with the downside? Now, to that degree, you just can't lie to yourself. You can kind of lie to yourself about the upside. That's that's natural. I'm going to get so rich. It's going to be great. I'm going to have a nice shirt and good car. Everyone's going to love me. It's going to be fantastic. You just can't lie about the downside. And so what I like to follow is a train of thought that allows me to go to the extreme. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, like how bad could this get? Like, what is the extreme downside? Like, could it potentially bankrupt me? Could I look, like, and it's not just in real estate, it's, it's in life. Mm -hmm. if you follow that train of thought and go, okay, if I make this decision, there's this potential upside, makes me feel good. What is the extreme downside? Uh, maybe I go bankrupt. Maybe I lose all my friends. Maybe I've got to go move back in with my parents. You know, but then it's like, would it be worth it? Would it be worth it? Is, is it? is it worth it? Is it worth the risk? Is it worth that risk? Not is it worth the risk of it not going quite as good as I want, but is it worth the risk of it going as bad as it could possibly go? And mm -hmm. it's when you can weigh that up and go, yeah, okay, I'm ready for that. That's when you can make a good decision. But that's like, this kind of goes back to your thing about like the right decision, wrong decision. You go on, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to make this choice, even though I know it's not the right, but you know, almost every circumstance you could, you could make a, a justification that like, Hey, the worst could possibly happen and I'd be better off just sitting on my couch, but you can't just sit on your couch for the rest of your life and never make any decisions. Like you have to live a little bit too. Like where's your threshold for, you know, when does just being risky becomes a risk of a mundane and boring life? Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. I guess I haven't thought about it like that because I have a tendency to think about the upside. So when I think about the upside, it's not like, I don't know. The upside is I could get a hundred bucks a week, but the downside is I could die. Right? <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, uh, well, I don't know. Like, do I want a hundred hundred dollars a week or death? They're not equally weighted. They're not equally weighted, yeah. and I think that that is something that, like, we we're actually going into uh, motivation at this point, right? So, what what mm -hmm. would actually get me off the couch? Well, what would get me off the couch? What motivates me is the upside. You know, it's not yeah. hundred. It's not the hundred dollars a week that I could get out of one rental property. It's the fact that I could maybe own 30 or 50 rental properties. But what if mm -hmm. I, what about if I pursue that avenue and I go, well, I could own 50 rental properties and I could have $200,000 passive income and I could retire in Bali, right? And just never have to worry about anything. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. I'm going to retire at 30. I'm going to be rich. And you, you've got to go there emotionally. I think you've got to, you've got to drive your emotional vehicle to that destination and sit around for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just float it. Just float around. Check it out. See it. Live it. Smell it. Feel it. And go. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And if you believe deeply in that that choice, and you're like, you know what? 
even if I don't get to that destination, if I, even if I drive my car back and I actually start this journey again and I don't get all the way to that destination, I'm going to end up somewhere close and that's going to be pretty sick. That's, that's, what, that's the motivation because it's like, okay, that's the promised land. All right, yes, I want that. And then you're going to be like, okay, how badly do I want that? Am I, how, what am I prepared to risk? Like how, how full out am I prepared to play? Like mm-hmm. I've, had time, I've had times in business I've had times in business where I've literally been down to a hundred dollars and, and been like, okay, uh, I don't know. Like, and you know, we're playing full out. We're working like 18 hours a day, which I don't recommend. There's way better ways to, to run business and stuff. <laughs> um, but like, and, and like, okay, there's like a hundred dollars left. Okay. Do we sell the car? Should we sell the car? Maybe we need to sell the car. Cause we don't have any, like, we're like, how, how far will you go? And that's a question I think everyone needs to ask themselves. How far Will they go to get the thing that they desire? Now, the thing that they desire may very well be, um, it may very well be a good life, good calm life with their family without too much um, turbulence and all of that kind of stuff. And that's totally cool. Like if that is what your heart mm-hmm. desires, then pursue that. Pursue that with a passion that will allow you to break through walls to make sure that that is the success that you achieve in life overcome any obstacle and break through any wall to get there. If you want something else, then you're going to pursue that other thing. The downside is like you, you'll know if it's the right decision, if you're like, yeah, yeah, it's still worth it. That's, mm-hmm. I guess, how and, I and I think too, you know, when, you, when you, it's your starting point, you know, if you say I, I, I'm just on my couch and I've got nothing to lose other than, you know, maybe my couch and in my life and is is this deal going to kill me probably probably not actually going to physically kill me but i could lose the little that i have and i wouldn't be that much different than where i'm at so you're gonna say you know what it is worth it i'll, I'll take a little bit of risk and then maybe you do that three or four 10 20 times the next thing you know you're, you're doing pretty good you, you're almost at that destination you want to go to and you look at hey do i want to make this deal or not you say oh i got a lot more to lose i might be a little bit more conservative about these choices because I'm pretty close to the destination. It's pretty sick, but it would be really bad to lose it all. But if I just got a little bit better, it might not be be there too. So I think everything has its its, its risk reward. And when you're starting out, your 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 tolerance for pain and a wild ride, I think, is a little bit more than when you start having responsibilities and, and other things. Yeah, I, I think there's an interesting point there. Is the the level of adversity that you can face and overcome will diametrically is diametrically opposed to the level of success that you can have i think because if you've lived a life that is you know pretty like in the middle let's just say if you you grew up in a in a reasonable family in a reasonable house and like and this is not this is not an absolute right but if you if you never experienced any levels of extreme then it, it it narrows your field of 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 how far you can go and mm-hmm. that will narrow your activity perspective so for example if if your lowest point was um was you know that you literally got down you got down to nothing you know you had literally nothing left to lose and you managed to pull yourself back from that precipice where the only position to move downwards from there might have been death right mm-hmm. if you can pull yourself back from that precipice then everything else that you experience in your life is going to be hedged against your ability to overcome that challenge and you'll have an unrivaled ability to excel, exceed, and overcome the challenges that you face ahead and that's going to dictate the, your ability to navigate that. Yeah, I definitely agree that, that if you've been there in the lose-it-all situation or, or come close to it and, you, and you've recovered from it, and you look back to, hey, what would happen if I lost everything? It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pleasant, but you know you've done it before and that and that there's probably ways that you would say hey if i had to redo this and start from scratch i would i would not learn all these dumb lessons i learned the hard way this time i'd start right here and it wouldn't take long before i'm back to where i'm at so that leads me to my next question is um the words all in what does being all in on an idea or an outcome mean to you what does all in mean to me I think all in is a um, as much as anything, it's a it's a philosophy to me. I I don't believe I don't believe that you'll ever get what you want out of anything 
unless you're prepared to go all in, which might sound extreme, which might sound extreme, but I think that you can apply that to anything that you want. You know, you could say like, I'm going to cook a really nice dinner. Oh, well, I don't know. I'll like, I don't know. I'll just go and knock a couple of things together and you probably end up with an okay dinner, right? Mm-hmm. If you go all in and you're like, no, I'm going to really commit to this. I, I really, maybe you want to impress your partner or whatever. When you go all in, you allow the untapped resources of your spirit, psychology, you know, metaphysical um, parameters to, to really be exposed and brought to the fore. And I guess for me, it's a question I haven't actually been asked before. So I'm interested. That's why I'm thinking through thinking it through. And I really like the question. What does all in mean? I think that I think it should actually be a guiding principle for most people, because if you really distill it down, you know, why, why would you not do anything and be all in? And, and the only read, the only answer to that is, is, you know, fear and ego and all of these other kind of things, which are um, barriers to be, to be overcome. And one of my, um, one of the affirmations that I read every morning is, um, you know, is in everything, in everything I do, I want to strive for greatness because to aim for anything less is to aim for mediocrity. And I'm much better than that. And I think that if you're not going all in, you are, and, and, and this is cool. This is totally fine, right? It is absolutely fine to have areas where you don't go all in, but you need to also recognize that by not going all in, you're not giving it your best. It is mediocre. And you've got to, you at least need to own that. You need to at least go, well, I'm going to be all in on these things and I'm okay with being mediocre on those things because I just don't value them as much. And I, but I think if you're conscious and cognizant about that distinction, that is going to help you drive the values and the activities in your life to give you a much better and more fulfilling existence. I think, I think you definitely come in as a person that's very like all in on what you're valuing. And then when you do make that decision of what, what you're valuing is important. Like you're like, Hey, yeah, it's, it's not nonstop. There's no holds barred uh, on, on this decision. So I can, I can definitely see that in you. Now, somebody's, um, you know, looking to invest in real estate in Australia, like, who are the people that are going to find the most value working with you? Like who's your ideal customer, your ideal client that, that you're working with the person that's going to, you know, you're really going to find that you vibe quick with, and you're going to offer a ton of value because you're, they're just, you're not the right people together. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I think that the, the, the idea of an entrepreneur, which a lot of people associate with business, but I believe that it goes. There's a much more deep-seated, um, like personality complex around entrepreneurial people. They're the kind of people that fit best with us. They're the people who understand risk, um, know how to manage it. I'm I'm like the lowest risk person in real estate in the world because I don't want to buy and hope. Because I'm like, no, no. What if everything? What if everything goes wrong? Right? Yeah. <laughs> how, do hedge, how, do, how do we hedge against that? But I think you need to understand risk, be able to manage risk, have a growth mindset. Um, you know, have a desire to or have a vision that you want to chase and achieve. A lot of people uh, want to approach uh, real estate investing in a really passive set and forget. I'll just put some money over there and I'll keep working my job. I think the people that are most suited to work with us are the ones that have got a fire within them and a really and a spirit that wants to achieve and is looking for some guidance to help master those strategies and and you know maybe maybe they're business owners as well. I think if I would distill it down, I would say. Entrepreneurial people, like, so you can create a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. That would be you know. that's awesome to to be able to identify, you know, clearly who that ideal client is. So, where can people uh, find you if they want to get connected? Yeah, man. Um, we actually have a podcast too, which really helps, and you can check that out at um, theinvestorlab.com.au. And from there, we've got an online community which you can access to. Um, and if you want to connect uh, with us as our um, as our real estate buyers agency service, just head to dashdot.com.au. I'd uh, be more than happy to help. And if anyone's got any questions about investing in Australian real estate, just feel free to get in touch. I'm more than happy to offer my advice, insights, and guidance in an unfettered way to to bring value to any any people listening to your audience. I'd love to help. So. Awesome, awesome. Well, of course, those links will all be in the show notes. They'll be able to connect with you. So please reach out to, to Goose, see what he's up to. I'm sure he's got some 
good stories on this podcast and uh, you'll learn a lot from them. Awesome. I had a great time chatting with you about uh, a little bit about real estate investment, but also we talked a little bit about mindset and, uh, you know, dealing with uh, risks and overcoming what, what's holding us back. So cool. I had a great time with you on. Absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. All right. Sorry about the recording dumping off in the middle. <laughs> all good. All good. We got a lot of value. <laughs> yep. Take care. Make sure to visit our website, therealnatepayo.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of All In. While you're at it, if you found value, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if simply tell two friends about the show. Looking to connect? You can find Nate Payo on LinkedIn or Instagram.